Um, high fat dairy products, sugars are very, very, um, very concerning because we're getting lots and lots of sugars through also our beverages, um, sugary drinks, you know, 0.9%, only two to 3% of adults obtain their recommended dose of fruits and vegetable intake, really problematic because this is a high issue of why chronic illness is, is on the rise. So saturated fats, I know you guys all heard about this. We talked about this last night in our small group, um, is that saturated fats, it's, it's linked through lots of science through uh, for causing heart issues, cholesterol elevations, heart disease, diabetes, things like insulin resistance. And again, insulin resistance, all of these things are risk factors for other things. So if you have diabetes, you're higher risk for heart disease. If you have hypertension or obesity, you have higher risk for getting all of these other issues too. So they kind of all round, you know, travel with each other. So insulin resistance is a big problem for polycystic ovaries disease, fatty liver, which is increasing exponentially where we are having problems with non-alcoholic liver failure, which is from not alcohol anymore, but this concept of um, fructose corn syrup or other things that activate our insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, which is a compilation. We have to, we have to coin a term now because all of these, these illnesses are kind of, kind of coming together. And that's what metabolic syndrome is, is a compilation of multiple issues, including low HDL, high triglycerides, increasing waist circumference, hypertension. All these things are kind of coming together because they're all related to the same risk factors. Okay, so we know the epigenetics show that high fat, um, high calories can actually alter your DNA. It can alter your nRNA expression, which changes the proteins that are being um, that are being generated, which can actually induce inflammation in our body. It alters DNA methylation. It increases the inflammation pathways that are considered pro-inflammatory. Remember. Pro-inflammatory pathways are important when we have things like cuts, uh, virus infections, and things like that. But then it's got to shut down. It's got to shut off. But when we have these these um, messengers that tell our DNA that hey, keep going with this because we still are in a in a state of acute inflammation, those pro-inflammatory pathways stay on, and that can be triggered by trans fats and saturated fats. So processed foods are also problematic and they kind of come into some main um, subsets of foods like wheat, um, corn, things like fructose corn syrup, maltodextrin, other names that you hear about that are derivatives of corn that are not really actual corn. Um, soy is also a, a main problem that's kind of processed in many ways. We have all these like plant-based foods, quote unquote, that are processed soy. So if anyone's looked at like those... Um, sorry, well, this isn't soy, but they have those like Beyond Burgers and meat alternatives, if you will, that are just maybe maybe slightly less unhealthy, but they're still really unhealthy with the amount of processing in there and the amount of um, saturated fats in there. So when we think about plant-based, we want to think more about whole foods, unprocessed, without chemicals, preservative-free. Um, that is more of a bigger concept than just having a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet, because it is um, the quality of the foods that are really matters. And as much as you can stick to things that are its original form is very important and to have it not have any of these issues in there. Um, do you want to spend some time on fructose corn syrup? Because it is a big, big problem that's linked to many uh, uh, things like hypertension, again, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, um, obesity, central obesity, the fat deposition can be central. Um, metabolic disturbances. And, you know, I would say try to limit it to none, but the studies show that there was harm over 50 grams per day. And the epigenetics of this has been seen that in those who take um, significant amounts of this, they were having increased heart disease and increase in pro-inflammatory pathways. And it also increases the cholesterol pathways. So, uh, you know, 60 to 70% of um, our cholesterol comes from genetics of how much our liver makes. And um, maybe 15 to 20, sometimes 30% is listed as what we're taking in by mouth. But that's just the cholesterol. But certain foods that we eat can increase the way and how much amount our, our liver makes. So it's not just what you're eating that's coming through as the cholesterol, but it's signals to tell the liver to make more cholesterol when we're eating foods 
that are high in saturated fats or high in free sugars. And, you know, just looking at, uh, it's crazy what things have sugar, ketchup has sugar, you know, things that are bottled and canned and, you know, just start looking at labels. And my patients are always floored at why French fries would have, you know, high fructose corn syrup, but it's everywhere and it's addicting and it's, it makes you want more. And it's very, 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 um, you know, people put it in their, um, their fast foods because it tastes good. And of course, you're going to get more consumers if your food tastes good, because our gut microbiome is also in charge of our taste buds. And when we eat unhealthy foods, we are going to crave unhealthy foods. The good news is as we switch that diet to more whole food plant-based, our palate starts changing. So in my practice, when I tell people they have to get off cheese, they have to get off meats, they, I mean, some people cry. I mean, it's, it's, it's like very overwhelming to kind of have all this told to you. But however, you know, know that, you know, when I say things like, you know, cruciferous vegetables, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, spinach, kale, people tend to get really uncomfortable because they never like the taste of it. But as your palate changes, as you do more with these kind of foods, adding whole foods, the microbiome starts changing and our taste buds change. So, you know, the cravings that we have of salt and sugar and sweet and sour, umami and savory are all legit things that we are on our, our taste buds, but they will start to change what they crave. Your body will start to change it as you remove some of these things and add more whole food. So that's really encouraging. It doesn't take a lot of time. It's only a few weeks. Sometimes it's four weeks. People are like, oh, I can't even look at a soda anymore. I can't even have a chocolate chip cookie. I had someone this morning tell me that she doesn't even, she used to be addicted to cookies. And now she's been doing the diet that we've been talking about, our food plan, I like to call it versus a diet. Um, that she doesn't even want to look at her cookies. She thinks it tastes horrible. So that's wonderful. And it, it, it didn't have, take that long. And it's very exciting to see. Um, Anti-inflammatory pathways are also um, really, really important to talk about these things called essential fatty acids. So there are good fats that help de increase our anti-inflammatory pathways epigenetically. So uh, polyphenols, which are phytonutrients, they're chemicals that are on the colors of of plants that are really, really essential to the signaling. They're basically cell messengers that tell the microbiome and tell our cells of our body, um, to, you know, they tell them to do things. And so they're loaded in, you know, unprocessed grains, chocolate, red wine, tea, fruits, and vegetables. Fiber, like I said, is so key. It's, uh, it's so important because it's such an anti-inflammatory input. Um, different, the different phytochemicals like phenolic acid, flavonoids, again, colorful, colorful uh, fruits and vegetables and colorful plant products, um, also in spices. Resveratrol, gallic acid, and curcumin have also been studied for epigenetic changes that they cause to help us. And we're going to spend some time talking about these. Okay, let's start with EPA, DHA, which is an essential fat. They're omega-3 fatty acids. Um, omega-6 fatty acids tend to be very inflammatory, and the standard American diet has a huge amount of omega-6 fatty acids, which can be very inflammatory. So that ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 omega is very skewed. That number is very variable. It ranges from, you know, one to four to one to 20. And so we, we want, basically at the end of the day, we want less omega-6s, much, much, much more omega-3s. Um, always like to do it through foods if possible. We do a lot of, um, you know, nutrient testing in the office so we can see when people are deficient in omega-3. So sometimes we supplement with the omega-3s as well, but we always start with food. We start with things like walnuts and chia seeds and flax seeds, hemp seeds, kale, avocado. And there is some data to show small amounts of, um, of, uh, sorry, the, um, olive oils, the, um, can also be, uh, anti-inflammatory. The oil concept is controversial. I'm sure you've all heard multiple different viewpoints of it. Less is more in general, but in the epigenetic literature, there is some data to show that um, olive oil can be um, anti-inflammatory and turn on some of those genes to lower inflammation. It really needs to be personalized. Um, I don't want to say broad strokes for everyone to do it or not do it, but it needs to be personalized to your cardiovascular risk, your endothelial risk. There's also data that show that um, oils can be um, inflammatory to the vascular endothelial cells. So the personal risk history is important. 
um, the milieu of like where you're eating it and how much you're eating it and what concept you're eating it, it also needs to be understood. So less is more, uh, but our cookbook does have some um, olive oil in it and avocado oil in some of the recipes, usually more as a spray or a very, very little amount, but we do have recipes in our books that include some of this. Mm -hmm.